So with that, we had uh, you know, five interesting presentations and I can see uh, we have um, 10 minutes time and we have received uh, many questions you know in the chat box uh, it's difficult to you know difficult to respond in just 10 minutes you know but i will pick up uh, uh, four questions rather five questions to five speakers the rest of the questions can be answered leisurely at a bilateral discussion or in some other opportunities so may i um, open the floor and uh, the first question is by you know david Camarox, uh, and uh, he asked to Professor Sutipand uh, that uh, you know the Kra Canal project uh, and uh, that what are the views of Singapore and Malaysia on this canal projects? So Professor Sutipand, this is the questions you may like to answer, but just hold on. Uh, there is a similar question also, you know, raised to you and uh, to both you and Professor Charit that uh, the Kra Canal and that land bridge. Uh, you know, both are you know integrated so uh, and these are and, and they are going to change uh, the the ocean transportation you know in the indo pacific but there are huge costs you yourself said in your presentation so so can you please explain uh, that what could what could be the benefits of the trade offs little more i mean you may not have to explain everything but whatever you could these are the two major questions to you there is another question from uh, to you also from professor sankari uh, and briefly I, I will touch it i know I, you know it is uh, maybe you can have a discussion with uh, with uh, with she said it is coming from his it is a strong history and uh, in the contemporary period you know when she asked that how far was this factor in delaying in the Kra Canal project? Why it is so delayed? And uh, yourself said that there are Chinese are pushing for this. There are many other uh, agencies. Uh, so what exactly happened? Why it is not coming up? You in fact mentioned it, but briefly, if you can uh, touch upon, you know, without going particularly to any particular country, uh, you know, I think this is a, a conference for uh, you know in the Pacific. I, so please, these, these three sets of questions actually directed to you. There are questions to other speakers, and um, like uh, Dr. Sininath, you know, which I, you know, we we said, she said that you know uh, that uh, the the DEPA, which is the DEPA, and which is very interesting, you know, which is a post FTA kind of uh, the agreement speaking up by the countries in this time of digital connectivity. So questions to Dr. Sinina, that at what stage is the DEPA, uh, is this presently digital economy partnership agreement? At what stage is this is? is? Is it being negotiated or implemented? Also, there is um, RCEP, there is an e-commerce and digital connectivity chapter. So when you draw a, a digital plan or the blueprint, so uh, what is your view on, on the RCEP? Can they make it a, you know, lead to you know, on the digital connectivity programs, uh, be it at Asia wide or in the Pacific? These, uh, these are the questions to you. Dr. Ranbu has a couple of questions, one from uh, uh, Dr. Lipley and one from me, uh, that uh, when he, Dr. Ranbu said, you know, that, uh, you know he, he gave a over, over, you know, big picture about the um, energy connectivity in, in, in the Pacific and unconfident, which you, we perhaps missed it. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you can tell us, ASEAN, Australia, energy connectivity, India, China, we understand it, there is a grid to be connected, but how come ASEAN, Australia, if you can tell us, particularly to the audience in South Asia, you know, is it an underwater or what, what is it that you are thinking about it? Dr. Lipley has asked questions to you on uh, on, on on energy, that uh, you know, you presented several uh, challenges, both from, from the national point of view, particularly ASEAN member states, and also in the region. So, if you can elaborate, you know, sort of in regimes and energy regimes, energy institution, energy mechanism structure, which you could not explain more. Maybe some of your writings and reports where you, these are lying. Please uh, benefit us. You know how do you do a coordination, and you know, and the big pictures in terms of this is integrating the region through uh, a common energy pool on and the resources. And you yourself said that 
these all projects will reduce the gap uh, between the countries and energy uh, security uh, because it, the two security you talked about one is the energy security one is the climate security so if you can respond to that questions raised by dr lipley dr anupama uh, you know there are questions to you uh, from uh, kun Virapath, you know, he asks that, uh, how do you see the COVID-19 vaccine trade will be taking into account current demands globally? And uh, when you say resilience, uh, this could be, you know, on the vaccine trade, particularly from the point of where you are located in Vietnam. And uh, we could see some selective and preferences on the types of the vaccines, which means that some countries in ASEAN, they have borrowed from in particular source, some are different sources. So please um, tell us about uh, the vaccine diplomacy because this is a part of, uh, you know, uh, the resilience. And uh, it's the, and there is a question also I have raised that when you said Vietnam, Vietnam often comes to our mind, it is going to be the hub of FDA. You name it, all these are with the Vietnam. So is the Vietnam is going to replace China as a factory Asia? Do they have a capability? Do they have a resources? So far, you know, some of the sectors uh, I know uh, where Vietnam has become a champion. Uh, and uh, so please tell us, Dr. Somas Mathur also raised some questions, but directly not to your presentation. But if you have a time, that how is China, Korea, Japan, and the contributing to Vietnam GVCs in food textile and computer equipment, the textile, leather products, et cetera, et cetera, briefly, you know, and the production sophistication as Vietnam grows up, you know, and upwardly. Uh, there's a question from by Asian Conference, um, which is, I think it is to Dr. Anbu. Uh, what is the big impediment in process of integration of Northeast India and ASEAN in context of common power grid level? If Dr. Anbu, you have done so many studies on that from area, please uh, uh, respond to this. So these are the questions I, I have given to uh, the five eminent speakers. There are many resources there in the chat box. If I missed out some questions, please pardon me. Because of the time limitation, I won't be able to touch everything. In short, it, uh, we have time about 10 minutes to Q&A. So we have five speakers, two minutes each, if you can respond uh, to all these questions. Sorry for this injustice, two minutes to each and every one. Thank you very much. Starting with Professor Sutipan. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Prabhia, and thank for the question from David Kambru. In fact, uh, other questions about crack and I as well. I leave it to Professor Jarit. In fact, when both of us uh, took this project, a quantitative project, as a case study, you know, we always heard from uh, when we young, young. And uh, in, in our thinking, when we uh, this come back to this uh, uh, project that we try to work uh, in the context of ASEAN and Indo Pacific, we think is we try to put in a contemporary uh, context. Of course, uh, uh, the question about the, what uh, Singapore, Malaysia think about the project. So that's why it's, it's not new for them either. Um, and I think that particularly the, the, the 70s, when we try to really be serious about that project, um, uh, there are some remarks even from, I think that the Lee Kuan Yew himself, he's saying it's a project will never be materialized because of the cost, because of the, the kind of politics and security at the time. And I think that mainly Singapore already gone that far in terms of developing their own port and their whole things of Malacca Strait. So they not really feel afraid about uh, anything. Uh, of course, uh, this could be substitute if we like to build it. If we like, not really substitute, but as time we try to progress, they, they know the cost is huge. So that's why uh, the thing is uh, I domestic uh, politics at the time will probably uh, not, not allowed to, to, to do such a thing. Uh, Malay, uh, so the, the, the thing is still remain up to this day. I think that you, as you can see, the cost at the time may be, uh, well, equivalent to now the uh, almost 70 billion uh, US dollar, which isn't small at all, at the cost of to make the canova. 
For Malaysia, I think that you can see uh, on the uh, more contemporary project like a uh, Eastern Rail Line, you know, from the, uh, the so-called uh, Gulf of Thailand, uh, uh, South Chinese Sea side, a link into uh, Kuala Lumpur. So that's a uh, project and then to Klangpur. Uh, that may leave perhaps around 400 kilometers, which is longer than than the one you can, you already seen, uh, the 9A135, but still it made, it made a logical for Malaysian industrial development because on this part, there a lot of in industry, uh, industrial zone, uh, very different from Thailand because Thailand is more resource-based, uh, tourism-based, uh, for this, uh, so that's why I think that uh, Malaysia already gone far in terms of developing uh, all this area along the the, the 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 rail line. So that's a rail line respond to industrial needs, and uh, you also know behind there's uh, this part of the uh, what you call using Chinese um, uh, uh, BI part of it. Uh, you know the. the uh, that uh, Mahathir, uh, the last prime minister, came to comment about the cost involved and uh, what kind of the Chinese participation. So that kind of thing is, you can see uh, for the case of Malaysia, is for uh, Malaysian use for uh, a new uh, Chinese plan, because not forget that uh, Chinese investment in Malaysia is uh, is coming very important way in all this along uh, the so-called uh, train train corridor. So I would say that's probably uh, the case of Malaysia. It probably makes sense. The importance is about the uh, I don't know the cost exactly, but now they they try to bring it down uh, uh, when the Malaysian saw what uh, Najib Razak uh, negotiated for a higher cost. So he already brought it down when he was in Beijing, you know, during the, I think the second BRI forum. So he made such a strong speech and said, Malaysia agree, but also please bring the cost down. So uh, again, back to our project, I, I think it's perhaps I leave to uh, Professor Charit to go further about the, uh, perhaps the, the shape of brand bridge of, 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 uh, of uh, 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 the canal itself, if you like to have to add something. So that would be, um, you know, my uh, explanation about uh, how Singapore and uh, Malaysia are seeing it. Thank you. Professor Charit. Hello. Hello. Well, thank you for the question, David Cameron. Long time no see. Uh, as to your question about cost of the land bridge, I think the cost is always an issue, but and for this particular one, uh, it remains to be to be presented. So because it's a, the the study is an early stage where we are only selecting the port location, but it seems to me that the big cost items are really the, the port development on each side of the seas uh, at Chumpon and Renong because there will need to be uh, new ports uh, and with no, no obvious uh, demand uh, or uh, operators for the shipping, shipping services that will use these ports. It's a big question. Nevertheless, it seems to me that it's very important for Thailand to, to have it because it will be the only uh, outlet that is international standard. On our study, we have seen that there are now ports, local ports uh, in Ranong provinces uh, that, that are used to supply uh, customers in Myanmar and from Nyak up to up to Rakhine State uh, using uh, with goods from Thailand. Now the idea of the language is that it's not just for, for for Thai use, but it will be open for international shipping line. 
what is possible if we can imagine it is that there'll be some kind of regional shipping service, uh, perhaps an, an ASEAN shipping company with joint investment from ASEAN members to, to make use of this the, this shipping service, uh, this location. Of, of course, not just limited to to, to the new ports, uh, but also to other ports as well. And that can serve uh, so, uh, exporters from from right from Vietnam right down to Myanmar on both sides. Uh, of course, Malaysia and Indonesia have their own outlets to the to the Indian Ocean already, so they perhaps don't need it. But I think it may, there may be some purpose in aiming to to, to this, these you new know, ports to serve the, the greater Mekong countries. So that would be my response at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sininath. Uh... Okay, thank you for the question, Dr. Fabi. So um, let me start with the first one for the DIPA, um, Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. So right now, the, uh, the progress right now is that um, uh, three countries, Singapore, Chile, and New Zealand, they signed on um, 12 of June, 2020. And up to now, on the, uh, the 7th of January um, this year, so Singapore and New Zealand, they um, come into force right now and they start working on some um, project. For example, they kind of like think about uh, how to create like international uh, connectivity system. So the benefit of this one is that they can exchange like e-certificate for animal products such as the meat and the meat product between two countries. So they kind of like keep working. And, and one more thing is that um, one more country interesting right now, um, Canada also would like to join, and that is a progress right mm. now. Uh, for the ASEP, um, this is another one, another channel, I would say that, um, you know, like one of the, you know, very up-to-date agreement that mentioned about e-commerce and digital connectivity. So I'm sure this can be one platform or one uh, framework that, um, you know, like both ASEAN and also country from Indo-Pacific can join together. I think um, with the characteristic of the, you know, like mega FTA and, um, to um, think about all the country in, in ASEP to move together, it, it may be a while, but one good thing is that it set, it set the theme and also the direction of where the, the region gonna move into. So my view on this one is that uh, I think it's gonna be like dual mechanism anyway. So at the regional level, at actually from the mega FTA like ASEP and also other mega FTA, uh, if you keep coming up with the, you know, like some agreement that uh, help with the data governance, also how to um, facilitate the digital trade and so on. But at the same time, I, I still believe that from the country by country basis, um, if they find that, you know, like they find some interest, for example, like they part from Singapore or New Zealand, so they find the interest, they see that there are benefits out there that they can utilize. So I think this is going to be like cluster, country to country, bilateral or smaller group that will keep working. So I would say um, two direction anyway, from the regional platform and also country to country to, to start this one. So that's my view on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Anbu. Kindly unmute, unmute. Okay, thank you. And uh, there are four questions and uh, I want to be very simple and straight. On the Australia, ASEAN, Greek connectivity, and uh, there is a progress in the talks at the very high level, and uh, where there is the uh, northern part of Australia could be connected to Indonesia and uh, East Timor also through the underground cables. And there is a done, there is a feasibility report has been done, and it is under the discussion by the uh, energy ministers. The challenge here is that is to realizing this connectivity is a, a kind of a, a different price regime. And, and uh, Australia, it is a completely an open economy and, and where energy prices are driven by the market, including this solar and the wind. But in the case of Indonesia and other ASEAN countries, uh, still heavy subsidy system exists. So how to cost, that is who is going to pay for the uh, cost. And it cannot be government and it cannot be consumer, then what else, who, who can be that? That is a challenge in the ASEAN and uh, um, uh, Australia connectivity. 
And then uh, ASEAN and China connectivity. I think uh, uh, here it is the, uh, here we do have a, one structural problem and another is the technical problem. Uh, China is very active in GMS, uh, Greater Mekong region. And uh, uh, last year, ASEAN had a high level forum on this energy and the water security. And uh, the challenge here is uh, the upstream uh, water harvesting, building the new dams. Uh, how basically it has a problem in the water deficit in the, the downstream countries like uh, Vietnam and uh, other countries, how to tackle it. The second thing is, um, uh, most of these Chinese investments are happening in Myanmar and Laos and Cambodia, basically uh, uh, developing their own hard infrastructure, uh, wherein this uh, technical standards is dominated by China. That gives a kind of long-term lock-in. That is, a, there is no third-party entry. It will be very costly in the latter years if if, if this lock-in happen. Uh, these are the two challenges that is we face in this connectivity between China and ASEAN. And third, uh, big vision and uh, ASEAN. We have, I think, everything. And uh, this is ASEAN plan of uh, energy cooperation, 2016 to 2025. And uh, it has the five streams. Uh, sorry, seven streams starting from the renewable energy and then uh, energy efficiency and then uh, finally including the nuclear. And uh, the, the, the challenge here is we do have everything in the, in the paper and uh, uh, countries has an agreed for it and uh, then agreed they progressively improving the uh, targets. What is missing is a kind of uh, uh, monitoring, reporting and uh, verification system where this is current to future investment is happening and what will be the future. So that is each country can prepare for it. I think uh, that kind of uh, uh, cooperation and, and uh, at, the, at the AM's level is important and that could be supported by the other neighboring countries also. Uh, if we are looking for a, uh, a regional level decarbonization. And because most of this uh, uh, carbon emissions current and the future will be occurring from the energy sector. My final point on the, on the Northeast India and uh, um, uh, ASEAN. And uh, here, I think most of the connectivity will be happening in uh, through Myanmar. I think that is Myanmar would be the gateway for connecting the India and the uh, Thailand. And uh, here we found uh, our studies, academic studies and modeling studies and indicate a lot of potential. Uh, but the potential, to harness the potential, we do have uh, uh, different policy uh, hurdles and as well as the lack of standards. And also more, another, another problem that is uh, coming up is uh, who is going to uh, get this uh, credit for the green credits. And for example, Northeast is also supplying energy to uh, Bangladesh. It is a kind of, for Bangladesh, basically without building any, any new power plant, that coal power power plant, they can easily get the credit for reduced emissions. At the same time, basically India is losing that credit. And then basically the beneficiary is somewhere from this. There is some kind of asymmetry. And this asymmetry has to be discussed and resolved. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Anbu. Uh, to uh, Dr. Anupama, briefly, if you can, Reply. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> so many questions uh, to you as well. Thank you, Prabir. I remember only three. I think there are only three. So the first question is uh, vaccine diplomacy in Vietnam. Vietnam received vaccines in two bunches, is what I remember. Uh, some 30 doses, 30 million doses of AstraZeneca. Then later, they're waiting for uh, another 31 million doses of Pfizer. Uh, and I, Japan, China, UNICEF, they have uh, offered to send about five to 10 million doses of vaccines. Uh, I also read that uh, Vietnam is letting the provinces, businesses, and cities to import vaccines on their own. So the aim is to maximize or uh, vaccinate as many people possible, even if it means provinces import it on their own. And the second question is, uh, will Vietnam emerge as a hub? That's, uh, I don't have absolute answer, but what I observe here is many industries are newly relocating to Vietnam. 
uh, some provinces are uh, having Taiwanese electronic and machinery equipment industries. And this is what I hear from people that, who work there. But in terms of number, size, I'm not aware of it. But the new industries are uh, coming to Vietnam, that's for sure. And uh, generally, the construction business goes on here. That surprises me, even though, uh, and I'm yet to understand that point. And the third question is how China, Korea, Japan are doing in Vietnam. As far as I understand, they have the production base here. Since Vietnam did not have that extended lockdown phases, people kept going for work. So the factories were more or less functioning, unlike many countries where lockdowns were extended and frequent. So I, so that's what is my understanding for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Anupama, and I congratulate all the speakers. Because of time constraint, I won't be able to pick up questions, questions still coming in the chat box. Uh, please have your bilateral talk through email or other modes. So to conclude uh, this session, you know, I, we have a rich presentations and uh, we have many takeaways. This is an academic conference, unlike what we do in think tank forum. I am not going to, you know, read them out very clearly. So because of the lack of time, uh, I, uh, I request, you know, I, I will just thank to the organizers, uh, particularly the people behind uh, making this session and the program a grand success. And, uh, and Professor Clara, Professor Sutipan, Dr. Lipley, Kuntiti, and others for making it as a grand success. And congratulations to all the speakers. And we put our hand together and be a clap to all of you. So thank you. With this, we close. We we actually over sort of 15 minutes of this session. There is an important session, concluding session, session six, seven, uh, security issues and strategic challenges in the Indo-Pacific. So I hand over to the organizers, to Dr. Lipley, uh, and thank you.